All right, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 7, Strategies for Competing in International Markets. Now, maybe this will be blasphemy, but I can remember 10, 15 years ago, global was the, the word, the buzzword. If you're not going global, what's wrong with you? Uh, and a lot of people just jumped and went global. A lot of big companies that had the sense to not do that went global, went just huge. The only reason you would ever go global is because you think that by going global, you'll be more profitable than you are if you don't go global. You don't go there because you like to brag at a party, yeah, we've got international offices. You don't go international because you want to be able to fly to Paris a couple times a year to see your office there. That is absolutely worst way, worst reason in the world to go global. I love international business. Good gracious, and I've traveled, and I've seen it, and I've talked to them, and it's just wonderful. But you wouldn't want to go over there unless you could make more money going over there than not going over there. That's why you would do that. Now, whether that means you maintain a competitive advantage, maybe I can't measure it right now over the long haul, I'll be more profitable, that's fine. There's got to be that positive aspect before you ever decide we're going to go global. Because once you go international, you better have a ton of money somewhere. Because it's going to cost you a fortune. That's fine. If you can spend a fortune and, make an afford and then make back a for fortune plus some money, that's great. But just remember that. If you don't think you can make some money, we're not going to go global. However, let's decide that somebody has shown me that Excel spreadsheet and shown me that market research and actually you know, convinced me, yes, there is a real good opportunity. That's where we need to invest. All right, I'll do it. Here's some key reasons they should give you in addition to uh, the investment return. Going global will gain us access to brand new markets and customers. Absolutely. Never thought about that. Would love to go over there. If that market is there and if that demand is there, oh yeah, and if I can get over there, you know, in a profitable manner, absolutely. Why wouldn't I do that? Second thing, to achieve lower costs through economies of scale. Maybe I can go over there and combine that operation with something else, and it absolutely will give me an economy of scale. I'm making a ton of it right here in the United States. Maybe I can make it and ship it over there and make money. Maybe I've got the technology that I can transplant over there and make it over there. These economies of scales will help me. The more units I can make, the lower that cost per unit comes down to a point. And so, great. If I can make that happen, then that will be very good. To further exploit core competencies. I'm real good at this particular aspect of the business. Let's say it's marketing. That's my core competency. I could sell a bald man a comb. I'm good at that. I know how to package it. I know how to talk about it. I know how to sell it. Well, if by going to a bigger market like China and I've got that, I'm determined they've got the income and I can sell it, why not? Why not go find that market? Number four, to gain access to resources and capabilities located in foreign countries. Sometimes you have to go there. Okay, sometimes, you know, the mountain goes to Muhammad. You really have to go to where you think that capability is. So you need to understand that, that sometimes I need to go play in that ballpark because that's where it is. That's where that's happening. And the last one is to spread business risk across a wider market. I don't want to put all my eggs in one basket. So I'm going to go to these different areas of the world with different economies, with different tastes, and spread my risk. That's what I'm going to do. All right, your text describes several strategic options for going global, going international. Um, and it's almost ad nauseum. Um, so I'm going to put it, I'm going to give you the country version of that because I doubt you'll remember that. I mean, you, can, you know, I've read it and I don't remember it, kind of, uh, but I do remember this. I go back to my list. I remember a list. So here's a list. 
of things that you need to think about and it goes from the easiest to the most complex from the least capital uh, uh, requirement to the most capital requirement of how to go international. All right, the first one, so we're going international. First one, niche marketing. Niche marketing means you have a very, very small market segment. And the cost of approaching that market are small so that if you really don't succeed, it's not a killer. But if you succeed, it can really be very profitable. So this is why a lot of people like niche marketing. You can stick your toe in, and if you really don't get good results to begin with, you can just back up, and yeah, you lost a little bit of money, but not a ton. But if you go in and it's, it's, it's embraced, yeah, what a wonderful thing. You now have that to continue with. A great example of niche marketing is there was a, a chicken farmer, I'm not kidding, uh, in South Carolina who... I don't know if you've ever been in livestock farming, but when you graze livestock, you use everything. They say when you do cattle farming, you use everything but the moo. You sell everything but the moo. Well, with chickens, they did everything. They, they sold everything they could. You know, the feathers, the skins, the whatever. There was, you know. But the one thing they were having trouble getting rid of was chicken feet. Actually, you can buy chicken feet um, in the grocery store. But it really wasn't a big sale. They just couldn't get rid of their chicken feet. So they were basically cutting the chicken off, feet off, throw them away. But by the time they packaged them and got through all customs and everything, I mean, you, you, you know, the government regulations, they, they didn't want to make any money on it anyway. So they just threw them away. Well, this guy read an article that in China, they grind up chicken feet and they use it as an aphrodisiac. And they can't get enough of it. So he called some shippers and producers and he got the people involved basically instead of cut the chicken feet off instead of throwing them in a trash can he threw them in this hermetically sealed box they would when it full they wrapped it up and sold it to him at one point he was making more money selling chicken feet than he was off of his rest of his whole operation that's a niche market so if the niche if all of a sudden the chinese said no we don't believe this anymore he didn't, he didn't set up a whole new operation. He basically bought some extra boxes. So it wouldn't really hurt him if that market went crazy all of a sudden. So niche marketing. It's a way to stick your toe in the water without diving in. Second one, franchise or leasing. Uh, and you all know what a franchise is. McDonald's, um, whatever. This is a way that you can. Now, you know a McDonald's, a McDonald's leasee, or franchisee, excuse me, they own the building, they hire the workers, they buy the raw materials, uh, and then they have to pay McDonald's, I don't know, it's a bunch, 20, 30% of their profits. Uh, so now McDonald's gives them some national advertising and everything, but usually McDonald's is a gold mine, and they understand that, and that's why they're willing to pay McDonald's so much. But the point is, they follow McDonald's rules. They don't have to invent it. McDonald's gives them the recipe. There's a book that thick in every McDonald's says you how to cook a, a, a Big Mac. Um, they tell you how to clean the bathrooms. They tell you everything. Very mechanistic operation. So you buy it all and they just put you in place. Now it's going to cost you a fortune. Absolutely. But you'll make a fortune. So franchisee or licensing. Again, it's a little more involved, um, but it's pretty much... Uh, slam dunk most of the time um, so that's a you've, you've got this there's not a whole there's not that much risk in the cost return relationship three joint venture now we're getting a little more costly and a little more risky joint venture obviously is when you don't have enough capital to do it yourself or you need some additional capital so you go find a partner um, in Europe now remember we're talking about going global so in Europe, especially the Czech Republic, I know specifically the Czech Republic, if you go into a joint venture over there, if you go into it as an investor, you can only own, if you're a non-pay, if you're not Czech, you can only own 49% of the business. A Czech has, Czech citizen has to own 40, 51% of the business. That's to keep the money in the Czech Republic, to keep the, 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 the population of the Czech Republic involved in this investment, uh, to keep out carpetbaggers. Um, they go in with just a hand a bucket full of cash and buy up all this stuff that's not valued very heavily. Uh, so a joint venture. 
uh, to go international. Number one, it spreads the capital risk. Number two, it gives you some intellect in the foreign country. You don't know how to go to the Czech Republic. You don't speak Czech, one of the hardest languages on the planet, by the way. You don't speak Czech. Um, you don't know when the Czechs go on vacation. You don't know, I mean, is it okay to be open on Saturday morning in the Czech Republic? So all of these things you need to find out. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But joint venture, share the capital, share the culture. Number four, foreign branching. This is where you would take a, a unit of your company, let's, see, let's say America is the home company. You would take elements of that and put them in a foreign country. But the control of that would be in America. When I was with the bank, we had an office in London. We had a foreign branch in London. Now, it wasn't a branch bank like you think. It was like 10 stories of a 30-story building that we controlled. And the reason we were over there, you talk about old school, we were over there so that we could take advantage of the markets because at 8 o'clock in the morning in London, it's still like 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 o'clock in the morning in the United States. And so to take advantage of, so if at 8 o'clock the markets were doing something good or bad, we needed to have somebody on the ground. I see that's outrageous today. You know, your computer wakes you up now. Your computer takes care of that for you. Back in the day, it was a, you had to have a phone call at 2 in the morning. What should I do? So instead of that, they just parked somebody over there. That's outrageous for y'all to understand that, but that's true. But that's a foreign branch. You put it somewhere else because you think you can make money and because you think you should be there to take advantage of that, you know, actually the distance you're in. But very, very expensive. Oh, my goodness, very, very expensive. And then the last way to go international is foreign subsidiary, where you put a completely different, I mean, uh, you put a completely separate and isolated entity in Europe, like Ford Europe, by the way. Ford, your Ford does great in Europe. One of the ways that they sustain the, the car issue that we had, the problem with the automobile industry back in 2009, 2010, uh, Ford Europe kept Ford. Everybody said, well, Ford's making money. They're okay. It was their Ford Europe that kept them out of, out of, out of the hot water because they had a separate car over there. Now, you go to Ford, you go to Europe, excuse me, go to Europe and you look at these cars. The only thing that looks like a Ford to you is that that blue oval on the front that says Ford. These cars are built for European roads. They're tiny. They don't look like a Ford at all. They've got European names. You would never recognize it as a Ford if it did not have that logo on it. And that's why Ford went over there and said, if we're going over here, we're going to build you what you want. We know you don't want an LTD. We know you don't want that. You don't want an Explorer. It won't fit. It won't even get it out. You can't even park it. But we'll give you what you want, and we'll give you a good car. And they knew that the man was there, and they went over there, and they made a ton of money. Um, so, okay, you got that. The, the five ways to go international that are just kind of lockstep easy. Niche marketing, franchise, joint venture, foreign branching, and foreign subsidiary. Okay, so you got those. All right, so um, what do y'all think about that? What do y'all think about that? All right, calm down. All right, all right, just settle, settle down. That's ridiculous. Somebody's going to get hurt. Uh, please, please. I appreciate the exuberance. I really do. But you guys are just, you're embarrassing me and you're embarrassing yourself. You really are. So just stop, stop that. So here's the deal. If you decided you were going to go international, you're the CEO. They have named you CEO and you're the CEO. Something tells you you're going to make money. You've gotten a spreadsheet. You've gotten some marketing analysis. You are convinced if I go in there, we're going to make money. We're going to make some money. And let's say I'm going to France. I'll even get easier. You, we decided France is where we need to go. What is the first thing you would do? Come on, what's the first thing you would do?
Make a decision, Mr. and Mrs. CEO. You've just decided to go. You've made that decision. What's the first thing you would do to help you to formulate a strategy to get over there and make money? i tell you what you would do. The first thing you would do is you'd go to France, you'd find somebody with business sense, MBA, that speaks French, that is French, and you would hire them, and you are now in charge of my French operations. You cannot run it from Columbia, South Carolina. You know nothing about France. You don't even know what French wine is. You know nothing about France. Why would you try to do business in France if you know nothing about France? You don't even know anybody that's from France. Why would you do that? We, do, we have made that mistake so many times, it's comical. I would go over there and find me the smartest French dude I could. Now, I'd want him to be bilingual because I'd want him to be able to talk to me too. But you find a Frenchman who is smart and understands. They know when the schools close. They know when the shops close. They know when you can advertise, when you can't advertise. They know what goes and what doesn't go. They understand so much more about than just the business side of it. So you're going to find some, you're going to find a Frenchman. You can find somebody that truly, truly understands the situation over there and you're going to hire them and you're going to count on them and you're going to trust them because if you didn't do all those things you should never have hired them so the key to going international is buying buying the intellect and the culture and the language problems that you're going to have buy that asset don't be crazy you cannot run it you can't fly over there every two weeks and run that company Gum it! hire your Frenchman, quit being stingy, understand what you've got to do. All right, we just talked about ways that you can go international, and the reason I bring that up is because you're going to hear that, oh, we need to go international, and you need to say, number one, not unless we can make money, but if we can make money, here's some ways we can go about it. Here's some ways we can go about from stepping our toe in the water to just spending more money than we've ever had over there. So just remember that. Everybody read the book. Everybody take those quizzes. This is moving right along. We're getting close now. Peace. I'll see y'all later.